Some international treaties are driven by disasters, and that's the big message and takeaway point that I want you to get from this lecture on the marine pollution framework, which is commonly called MARPOL 7378. I'll explain why it's called that as we go through the lecture. So this is the fifth in our series of lectures exploring the development of, or the story of the development of international environmental regulation since 1945. In outline, we're going to look at the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, 1973, as um, amended by a protocol of 1978, so commonly called MARPOL 7378. I'll touch on the London Convention Against Dumping uh, and also International Convention for Oil Pollution Preparedness, Response and Cooperation, 1990, and also we'll go on to UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. It's also got provisions about marine pollution, um, but I more want to focus on UNCLOS in the next lecture when we look at it from a fisheries perspective. <coughs> okay, the context we covered in our previous lecture. So we're in the 1960s and 1980s. There's an evolving urgency and importance at a public level both nationally and internationally to address environmental issues. So environmental concerns are rising. And I want to mention an important international actor in this context in terms of marine uh, issues and marine pollution. So the International Maritime Organization was established under an international convention in 1948. And its main task has been to develop and maintain a comprehensive regulatory framework for shipping including safety, environmental concerns, legal matters, technical cooperation, mar maritime security and efficiency. So it's got a really good website, imo.org. So an important international body, the IMO. So you can go onto their website, lots of information there about them. So the context of the marine pollution system actually have to step back a little bit earlier than the 1970s. So there wasn't any international framework dealing with oil pollution from ships until in the 1950s it started to develop. In 1954 the United Kingdom organised a conference on oil pollution which resulted in the adoption of the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from, of the Sea by Oil. It was called Oil Pole uh, 1954. But it it was amended, but it basically didn't deal with, it dealt with um, small releases or operational releases while you're in port. It didn't deal with um, major disasters of a ship you know, running aground and breaking apart and pre preparation for that. It really dealt with things like uh, establishing prohibited zones which um, extended around land and in which ships couldn't discharge oil or mixtures containing oil. Uh, and required the contracting parties to basically allow for oil to be removed from ships so that they just didn't have to dump it in the water. So it was a relatively minor international treaty and it didn't deal with the threat of major oil spills from big ships. And through this period, so ships were getting a lot bigger. So post World War II there was the technological advances and ships started to get really big you know, so now we're familiar with these massive sort of container ships and tankers. But that, in, in the 50s and 60s, they were still, you know, growing. And they weren't to the same scale. So this actually looks like a relatively small ship to us now. But back in the 60s, this was a really large oil tanker. This was the Torrey Canyon. And in 1967, the Torrey Canyon oil disaster was a monumental event in terms of the um, awareness about the threat posed by shipping to the environment. It involved uh, this ship, the Troy Canyon. So notice in that picture, the ship is broken in two. But what it didn't, it, it first ran aground. It was actually good weather. And the ship um, was en route um, to England. And there was a well-known rock called Wolf Rock, which had been known to you know to for shipping for centuries and essentially at that time they didn't 
have a GPS um, system. They had to navigate by, I think they triangulated um, on the, off the land to work out the distance from the land and they misjudged how far they were from the land and in good weather they ran aground on Wolf Rock and got stuck and the vessel was holed and they couldn't get off it. And so you see here this black and white image and you can see the obvious oil slick uh, sort of around the front of the ship but then also behind the ship. So in a storm the Torrey Canyon broke apart it, the, and spilled its entire cargo into the English Channel. So this is a picture, just I haven't got them in chronological order, but they sent out tugboats to try and pull it off and you can see the ship there still in one piece, stuck on Wolf Rock and the oil spilling out. Uh, the tugboats couldn't pull it off and then after it, the storm broke it apart. After it broke apart, the RAF bombed it to try and reduce the oil, basically to burn it off. And there was a laughter at the RAF because this is you know, not that long after World War II and the ship was obviously stuck on a rock and the RAF missed it on the first bombing run. So the um, news um, talked about how bad the RAF had become. They couldn't even hit a stationary ship stuck on a rock. And, um, but eventually they hit it and set the oil ab ablaze and you know, these pictures, uh, you know, early colour images, uh, widely published and seen in time and life, very dramatic. Now, that was an important uh, incident or important disaster. And in the context of thinking about maritime jurisdictions, I just want to distinguish between three types of jurisdiction. One is the flag state, another is the port state, and the other is the coastal state. So the flag state is what do you think? Where That's right. So where a ship is registered. So historically, a ship showed where the country that it belonged to by flying a flag. So if it was from England, it flew an English flag. If it was from France, it flew a French flag. If it was from another country, you know, it flew that flag. And so you could you know, recognise friend from foe and uh, also when you were flagged in that country you were also subject to their laws. So for instance if there was a mutiny on board an English ship they could be, you know, they were subject to English law or if there was a murder on board an English ship they were subject to English law. So the flag state comes from that time. Ships still fly flags but it's not as obviously as important anymore. But flag state means the country that the ship is registered in. Now a ship can be registered really in any country uh, that it, w it wants to be. And one of the problems with regulating shipping is that if a country imposes expensive regulations on ships that are registered in its jurisdiction, a company can just basically take its ships and go to another country and register there and then be potentially subject to lesser laws. So the flag state is an important concept but it's also not set in the sense that you know the flags can change so a ship can move from one jurisdiction to another. And it's obviously no longer as important like you know maybe two centuries ago it would be really valuable if you were you know, under an English flag because then you would be, you know, the English had the biggest navy at the time and that would be a great thing. But it's not as important now uh, in terms of protection of a ship um, or, you know, a sailing boat or something like that, that it's under a particular flag. Uh, so flag state, that's the meaning of it. So port state, what's that? So think about a ship. It's out in the middle of the ocean, then it comes into Brisbane Harbour. Let's say it's flagged in um, Panama. So most shipping, a lot of shipping is flagged in Panama. Uh, it's, so it's a Pana Panamanian flagged vessel and it comes into the port of Brisbane. So who do you think is the port state? Australia. So uh, it's come into our jurisdiction and within Australian waters and within you know the port of Brisbane it's subject to 
Australian law and to Queensland law. So if, for instance, it discharged oil, you know, just decided to pump out its bilges and just pump it out into the Port of Brisbane, then they would no doubt be charged with breaching Queensland and um, Australian law. While it's out in the middle of the Pacific and it's not in port in Australia, it's subject to the law of Panama. So basically the flag state, when vessels travel outside into international waters, they're subject to the law of their flag state. Um, so port state, when it comes into port, uh, what about coastal state? What do you think that is? It's similar to port state, but it's wider, isn't it? So it's essentially any country that has a coastline in the ocean, you know, with an ocean. So that's most countries, you know. There's obvious exceptions like Switzerland is not a coastal state because it doesn't have a coastline. Uh, it's entirely landlocked. Um, but, you know, for countries like Australia, being a coastal state also gives you a range of rights to, under international law, to regulate things within your maritime zones. So that's a coastal state. And so even though it might, you know, that Panamanian vessel, if it comes into uh, Australian waters, even though it's not within a port, it can still be subject to Australian law. So if, let's just say it's, um, pass it in your, it's passing through the Great Barrier Reef, so it's within Australian waters and it decides to pump out oil. Um, it's going to breach Australian law at that point by essentially the pollution it causes. So flag state, port state, coastal state. Okay, so, yep. Yeah, so Switzerland can have vessels registered in it. So famously, Switzerland won the America's Cup one year, didn't they? they um, uh, so vessels can be registered in Switzerland, even though it doesn't have a coastline. It's not a coastal state, but it can be a flag state. Uh, it could also be a port state, because there could be a port on a lake within Switzerland. So yes, if you want to... But, you know, for general terms, you think about, say, something like Australia and you know, countries that have got oceans around them that go out to international waters. That's the more important thing. Completely landlocked states, Brussels can be registered there, but yep. Cool. Okay, let's just go back to the history, having thought about those um, different terms. So the, following the Torrey Canyon disaster, there was an international conference in 196, sorry, sorry, 1973 uh, and it adopted the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships. So that was the first part of this convention. But it failed to gain sufficient ratification to enter into force. And it looked like it wasn't going to enter into force. So even though there'd been this big wake-up call, this big disaster, the Torrey Canyon, it led to an international treaty being signed, but there wasn't enough ratification for it to reach the threshold for it to enter into force. And, yeah, it required the, the rule for, for entry into force required ratification by 15 states with a combined merchant fleet of not less than 50% of the world's shipping by gross tonnage to enter into force. Uh, and by 1976, it had only received three ratifications, Jordan, Kenya, and Tunisia, which, uh, not going to surprise you, and do not have a lot of merchant shipping um, registered in them. So why do you think... Why would you set that rule for entry into force for that convention? Like if you're, let's just say you're the United Kingdom or Australia or Panama or a country where there's quite a lot of ships that are registered in your juris jurisdiction at that time in 1973. Probably competition. Great, competition. It, you don't want, if you have agreed to this and you sign up and you're subject to it, but then one of your, because effectively countries are competing for ships to be registered in their jurisdiction because, you know, they pay registration fees and the like. So for, say, a country like Panama, one of its major sources of income is from ships registering in its jurisdiction. So uh, you don't want essentially to lose this source of income by imposing rules on your ship's that then your big competitors don't impose, so all of those ships then just basically change their registration and go to your competitor. So that's why 
it has a different rule for entry into force and it was basically to ensure that you know like a country like the UK could sign up and ratify it and even though you know its its competitors hadn't yet signed up it didn't enter into force until there was it went beyond 50% of the gross um, registered tonnage so yeah by 1976 it, it only had three ratifications uh, they represented less than 1% of the world's merchant shipping fleet and it began to look like the 1973 convention might never enter into force despite its importance. So what happened? There was another disaster. So this is the Amoco Cadiz oil disaster in 1978. Now you might not be that familiar with ships, you might not be a seagoing person, but um, I think you will be able to spot the problem with this ship in this picture, okay? So you can see there a big uh, oil tanker and y everyone knows that there's a difference between oil tankers and submarines uh, and this oil tanker is behaving more like a submarine than an oil tanker, it's meant to float. So there is a problem with this ship. So this is uh, the Amoco Cadiz in 1978 and you can see there again you don't have to be too familiar with ships to know that the coning tower at the back should be pointing towards the bow and the fact that it's pointing in a different direction <laughs> says that there's a big problem and the fact that it's underwater is also indicative of that. Okay, so this is where it ran aground and, and I'm going to play you a little uh, clip but essentially it ran aground in its engines failed in bad weather and it couldn't keep itself off the rocks. So even though it was a modern ship at the time and you know basically through technological failure not through wasn't obviously through negligence like the Turi Canyon was they just basically misjudged their position in this instance there was a big storm and um, the engines failed and this is some images of the oil beach in Brittany after it so completely covered in in uh, a slick of oil and I'm just going to play you a little clip um, again it's from that time, but it's, uh, I think I just want to keep taking us back to that time for the historic and political context. precipitating agents prevented the slicks from drifting to the Channel Islands. 
millions of litres of oil washed onto French beaches, reaching deep into the sand. The beach cleanup was carried out in two stages, the pumping of still liquid oil and the removal of oiled waste. All along the oiled coastline, animal and plant populations were dying in vast numbers. It had become one of the world's biggest environmental disasters. The Amoco Cadiz's cargo formed a dark, dead, slimy blanket both above and below the waterline, a dangerous mix of oil and water that polluted all life forms that drifted through it. The ecological impact was coupled with the long-term effects it would have on the local economy for shellfish and oyster fishermen. The oil, which belonged to the Shell Oil Company, created a slick 29 kilometers wide and 128 kilometers long. It polluted approximately 321 kilometers of Brittany coastline. The isolated location of the tanker and the rough seas hindered cleanup efforts for many weeks following the incident. The Amoco Cadiz slowly sank, but the wreck had to finally be completely destroyed using depth charges set by the French Navy. In 1978, the disaster was estimated to have caused over a quarter of a million dollars in damage to both fisheries and tourist services. The French government took legal action against the Amoco International Oil Company and presented claims totaling two billion American dollars to the United States courts. Ultimately, France was awarded 120 million dollars from the American oil company, but it took until 1990. The Amoco Cadiz oil spill was the greatest environmental disaster of its time, and as a result, the French government set up measures to reduce the risk of accidents and to ensure better rescue and response methods. The environmental impact of the Amoco Cadiz oil spill can still be felt to this day. So that's the Amoco Cadiz, huge disaster, and that essentially reinvigorated the push for marine pollution treaty to address you know, these huge disasters. So the 1973 convention was essentially reinvigorated, uh, and yeah, in response to particularly Amoco Cadiz, there was a spate of accidents through 76 to 77. The IMO held a conference on tanker safety and that led to the um, 1973 treaty being amended with a protocol. So the 1978 MARPOL protocol allowed states to become party to the convention by implementing different annexes. So Annex 1 dealt with oil Annex 2 dealt with chemicals, uh, and it basically was a staged approach, and that gave states time to overcome the technical problems in Annex 2, for which had been a major obstacle in ratifying the convention. So, um, yeah, as the 1973 convention had not entered into force, the 1978 MARPOL protocol absorbed the parent convention and the combined instrument, the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, 1973, as modified by the Protocol of 1978 relating there too. Obviously, that's a huge mouthful. Everyone just calls it MARPOL 73 slash 78. And it finally entered into force in 1983 for annexes one and two. And just to summarize, because if you were in, involved in shipping, it's a very technical, um, you know, large number of standards and technical requirements related to the different annexes. But essentially, 73, 70, MARPOL 7378 includes regulations aimed at preventing and minim minimising pollution from ships, both accidental pollution and from routine operations, and it currently includes six technical annexes. Annex 1 relates to oil, Annex 2 uh, chemicals or noxious liquid substances in bulk, Annex 3 um, packages, um, things kept carried in package form, sewage, Annex 4, Annex 5, garbage, and Annex 6, air pollution. So, 
an important framework if you're involved in shipping. For our purposes, it's, you know, I don't want you to, to be troubled by the technical details of it. Uh, it's been implemented around the world in a range of national laws. So in Australia, we've got um, you know, national laws that implement um, and prohibit oil pollution within our waters. And also it applies to Australian flag ships. Um, the Amoco Cadets is not the worst um, oil spill. I just um, put up this uh, table showing some of the worst. I'm going to talk about the um, Exxon Valdez in a moment. Um, but Amoco Cadets was number 10. Um, the Deepwater Horizon disaster um, recently, uh, also a huge uh, oil spill, number two. Um, but yeah, back in the turn of last century, there was a massive um, uh, oil spill uh, in the US related to, yeah, essentially an uncontrolled gusher getting out, which dwarfs, you know, makes everything else is dwarfed by it. Okay, so in terms of the, the convention, um, this is just the annexes. Uh, there's a large ratification of annexes one and two, uh, and but you know, um, not all of the annexes are equally ratified. So that flexibility was an important way that the people creating the convention overcame the, the difficulties of, of uh, states signing up. So it starts with, um, the convention itself starts with uh, the preamble that we talked about, setting out the problem that it's designed to address, and then sets out general obligations. And uh, as is common, it's linked to a set of technical annexes. So general obligations they undertake to give effect to the, the provisions of the protocol and the annexes. And then it enters into force. Um, we already talked about that, how um, you can set up entry into force based around different thresholds. And in this case, that it needed 15 states with a combined merchant fleet, fleets of um, not less than 50% of the gross tonnage. And yeah, they're the list of annexes. Just want to mention the uh, Exxon Valdez um, spill. So 73, 78, but if we move through time, the Another good example of how regulation can be disaster di driven is the Exxon Valdez. So in the 19, um, well, essentially this disaster occurred in the uh, end of the 1980s. It was an oil tanker that ran aground uh, in coming out of um, Prince William um, Sound in Alaska. So a pristine area. Um, here's the, there was a lot of oil um, being exported from the port, taken out of Alaska, and that's Prince William Sound. Just, and this is the area. So Prince William Sound, you see there that little harbour. Basically, Prince William Sound in this map is right up here. So the area affected by the oil spill was enormous, and it was a pristine area. Uh, you can see this map show it st starts up here, and it basically spread south southwest uh, along the coast. And that's a picture of the Exxon Valdez aground. And, and there's a really interesting documentary uh, about it, if you just go on YouTube, about wh what caused it, whether the captain was drunk or... Um, but essentially, the captain left a um, officer in charge who basically failed to take one of the... They moved um, out of the... Um, what happened was they moved, because of some ice flow in the, as they were coming out of port, they, they moved out of the shipping lane to avoid some um, ice, and they failed to turn back into the shipping lane in time, so they failed to make the co course correction, and they ran aground on a reef. Um, and, yeah, so there's an interesting documentary about it, or dramatisation about what happened, but the captain wasn't on the bridge at the time. Um, when the change should have been made and then it ran aground and I'll just play you a little bit from it. <laughs> 
fully laden super tanker hit a reef. On the 24th of March, 1989, one of the world's largest super tankers ran aground on Bly Reef in Alaska's Prince William Sound. The tanker, Exxon Valdez, was carrying 50 million gallons of crude oil. Just past midnight on March 24th, the supertanker Exxon Valdez crashed into a reef off the coast of southern Alaska. One of America's most magnificent waterways is blackened and befouled tonight by the biggest oil spill in American history. 240,000 barrels, 11 million gallons of Alaskan crude oil escaped from the huge vessel. The oil industry's response plans had promised a swift cleanup in the event of a spill. Seven hours after it struck Bly Reef, the toxic slick from Exxon Valdez was already two miles long and four miles wide. The tanker's single skin hull had been ripped apart. I ran out to the airport and the fisherman said, report back, tell us what you see. You know, we're talking happily because it's Cordova. We go, we fly out Orca Inlet. We come around Noel's Head and conversation just stopped. I mean, here is this incredible scene. The sun is just starting to come up. It, you know, it's an amazing scene. And flat calm, down on the water surface is this blood red tanker in a black inky stain. And above it is this cloud of bluish smoke. And we, you know, we're flying along and all of a sudden we're into this smoke. It was like instant headaches, instant nausea. And so we flew up above it and then we just circled and circled and circled. We're nine hours after the wreck and there was not a speck of promised recovery equipment on the water. This had all been promised within six hours, and we were three hours past six hours, and nothing. Ten hours into the spill, with the waters flat calm, conditions were ideal for a recovery operation. But the Alieska Consortium's oil cleanup equipment was nowhere to be seen. Not only was the Alieska team late, it could never have coped with the spillage on the scale. Already 11 million gallons of oil were fouling the waters of the Sound. Oil executives, the world's media, and the governor of Alaska were all descending on the scene of the disaster. The, the evidence is that the response was slow and inadequate. Uh, I think that's... With the Alieska cleanup team, where in sight, the governor arrived to find Exxon. The tanker's owners had taken charge. And they had a plan of their own. Exxon began limited tests of chemical dispersants to try to break up the oil. I'm going to pause it there. So there's heaps of stuff you want to look at that on um, YouTube, but it just gives you the context of the scale of the disaster. So TV crews descended upon uh, the scene and you know, it was an absolutely amazing en environment. So colour pictures were just flooding uh, television screens in the US um, with pictures like this, oiled birds, um, trapped and dying otters, um, clean up going on, huge death of wildlife and all set against this backdrop of this amazingly beautiful area. Uh, so the cleanup going on there. So this, yeah, with snow-capped peaks behind and oil in, in the foreground. So it was a really dramatic, um, and because it occurred in the US and was affecting US territory and was so, the area was so beautiful, it just drew this enormous public reaction. And basically, one thing that it led to was 
Uh, prior to that, these super tankers had only had a single hull, so when it hit the reef, it basically just spilled its cargo. And what the Exxon Valdez disaster led to was requirements that these big tankers have two hulls. So a double hull tanker is a ship designed for carriage of oil in bulk where the cargo space is protected from the environment by a double hull consisting of a double side and a double bottom spaces. You can see it there and you can put, um, yeah, sep separating um, the outer hull from the inner hull. So not a guarantee that you won't pierce the inner hull, but it's a big step forward from just having a single hull. So you can see the single hull there in the top and then the double hull tanker um, in, there's two versions of the, the double hull tanker there, um, one with just a single one and one with a double one. Okay, so get the timeline here. So the disaster occurs in 1990, sorry, 1989, and the US Congress passed virtually immediately. So in 1990, they passed the Oil Pollution Act, which um, required essentially all tankers in US waters to have double hulls and was to be phased in. But that then led to amendments to Annex 1 of Marpole in 1992 to make it mandatory for new oil tankers to have double hull and brought in a phase-in schedule for existing tankers to fit double hulls. And so that's been revised over time. So that um, act, the Oil Pollution Act, passed over with overwhelming, I think it was virtually a unanimous vote in favour of it by both houses of Congress in the US, which just in today's politics of the US seems incomprehensible, but it was driven by the wall-to-wall -wall coverage in the media of this incredible disaster and this huge public outcry for the US government to take action. So again, politics and the domestic politics driving a government to take action then leading to international you know, changes in the international framework because the US was such a big um, destination. Um, it's changing its law for what was required basically led to other countries then having to follow suit and changes to MARPOL. So, uh, you know, um, ships still run aground, as you know, commonly in the news, like a ship like this. This was a uh, ship that ran aground uh, a few years ago in New Zealand in good weather. And yeah, basically just ran aground on a well-marked reef, um, got stuck, and then caused a range of pollution. And then, you know, the cargo, you can see the cargo all sort of toppling in to one side, a really difficult, difficult salvage operation in that situation, but essentially stuck. And here's a, another example from a few years ago in the Philippines, in Manila, um, an oil spill. So oil spills still occur. So, you know, the international framework isn't a complete success, but again, I want to emphasise when we think about the effectiveness of these international frameworks, it's not a black and white total success or total failure. The international regime has certainly been made a substantial contribution to improving safety uh, and preventing oil spills. Um, I think that's, you know, it's just no doubt about that. So no doubt it can be improved in different ways, but you know, you've got to be practical. We've got the shipping that's going on. How can we make it as safe as possible? And then also, how can we pr be prepared if there is a oil spill, you know, by having the equipment ready to go, international cooperation to move around large, um, you know, spill cleanup equipment so that, you know, the international community can respond and individual nations aren't just sort of stuck with inadequate resources. So, um, I mentioned the oil Deepwater Horizon. It's not actually technically covered under MARPOL because it's not a ship. It was an oil rig. Um, but essentially it involved, I'm sure you all saw it on the news when it occurred, there's been a movie since, um, a oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico which um, caught fire and um, burnt um, with a <coughs> number of people uh, killed in it. And this is the um, Coast Guard vessels trying to put out the fire, but it was off um, Florida, uh, sorry, off Louisiana rather than Florida. Um, oh yeah, I suppose Florida's to the east. Anyway, off um, in the Gulf of Mexico, off um, the headwaters of the Mississippi River. 
and you can see a bit of the slick there. And here's just a diagram of basically what happened. It was drilling from the base and they lost control of um, essentially the, the um, gas came up the pipe causing it um, to um, ignite at the top and then the whole rig um, basically burnt and sank and then they couldn't um, switch off the oil coming out um, at the base of the ocean and that uh, there were a number of there was a sort of one of those uh, disasters where there was a whole host of things that contributed to it and the failure that's meant to have a basically a valve that can shut off uh, the the oil at the um, bottom of the ocean and that failed and they could only stop it after um, several weeks they had to drill in from the side and drill in uh, to the um, where the oil where they drill down to the oil reservoir and basically block it off so there was a huge spill came from that now I just mentioned before we wrap up this lecture um, could the Deepwater Horizon disaster occur here in Queensland and the simple answer is no and the main reason for that is because of in Queensland we actually prohibited in the 1970s we created the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and the, the reason why we created that was to stop um, oil, and, um, oil and gas development in the Great Barrier Reef and uh, also mining of the Great Barrier Reef. So think about it in the context where there have been these oil disasters occurring around the world and there was a push to start mining and developing the Great Barrier Reef and the Queensland coastline and no doubt there is you know, immense um, oil and gas resources along the Queensland coast. But basically the Australian government and the Australian community at the time decided we are going to rule out um, the entire Great Barrier Reef from mining and oil and gas development. It's probably the single most significant thing Australia has done in terms of addressing climate change. It it's actually wasn't intended, intended for climate change but basically we prohibited oil and gas and mining along this entire stretch of the Queensland coastline. So virtually the whole of Queensland you can't even go and explore for oil and gas. So there's no development of oil and gas along the, along the Queensland coastline. And yeah, that was a major, um, major achievement for the time and it was, yeah. So the Deepwater Horizon, very unlikely to occur in Queensland. Yes? Yeah, so yes, good question. Uh, yes, they did have consequences. It was still within the US national waters, so it was regulated under US national laws. And in terms of an international framework, oops, the uh, UNCLOS deals with oil and gas exploration in your coastal waters. So there is an international framework, it's just not directly MARPOL. So, uh, MARPOL is more pollution from ships as opposed to oil and gas platforms uh, or land source marine pollution. When you look at marine pollution, people often talk about ship source pollution and land source pollution. And yeah, MARPOL doesn't cover land source pollution or um, oil and gas platforms. Cool. Okay, so I'll just mention a couple of other conventions. Um, so there's the London Convention, the Convention on the Prevention of Marine Pollution by Dumping of Waste and Other Matter, uh, signed in 1972, called the London Convention. Basically, it's prohibited under international law to just take all your garbage or radioactive waste and take it out you know, beyond your maritime zone, put a whole heap of you know, weights on it and dump it. So you can't go out into international waters and dump things. That's pretty well what the London Convention says, but it also relates to establishment of facilities within um, waters. So um, MARPOL isn't the only convention dealing with these issues, is my main point. There's also an international convention on oil pollution preparedness, responses and cooperation. So often countries simply don't have the resources to deal with a big disaster like the Exxon Valdez. I mean that occurred in the US 
and even it was poorly prepared for it. So countries uh, coordinate and cooperate so that you know, large amounts of equipment can be, are, are at the ready and can be moved around if need be to go wherever it's, you know, wherever they're needed. And um, yeah, point I've made before, but I want to emphasise, keep emphasising that to be effective, these conventions need to be implemented in national laws. For instance, in Australia, we've got the Protection of the Sea Prevention of Pollution from Ships Act 1983, Commonwealth laws. Um, you can see that the timing of it, so 1983, it was enacted to basically fulfil the requirements of MARPOL 73-78. And then at a state level, we've got the Transport Operations Marine Pollution Act 1995. So if a ship came into the port of Brisbane, it's um, more likely to be subject to the Transport Operations Marine Pollution Act because it's within Queensland waters. And so if you discharged oil, it wouldn't matter where you were flagged, if you discharged oil in the port of Brisbane, you'd be prosecuted for that oil release. Uh, and I'll just mention UNCLOS as well. So marine pollution is, I'll deal with UNCLOS in the next lecture, but it also, also has a regime particularly around, uh, yeah, non-ship source pollution. So just to summarise this, uh, I wanted to keep it short. I don't want to get bogged down in the technical details about marine pollution, but I, th I really want to emphasise from these frameworks that... Um, these wider points, three wider points. Firstly, some international treaties are driven by disasters. So MARPOL 7378 was driven by the inadequacies of oil pole, 1954, and in response to major oil spills from ships, particularly the Torrey Canyon in 1967 and the Emma Cadiz in 1978. And the Exxon Valdez is an example of how it, it also moved on in response to another disaster. So that's an example of disaster-driven international frameworks. Now, there are some international treaties that are not directly disaster-driven, but rather attempts to proactively agree on a comprehensive planning and management of international problems. And UNCLOS that we're going to consider in the next lecture is an example of that. It's not driven by disaster, you're trying to get ahead and agree on things before they happen and manage them ahead of time. And in between that, some international treaties are a combination of both reactive and proactive management. And I want us to remember that when we go on and look at the climate treaties in the coming lectures, because clearly they're inadequate now. Um, but I'd suggest that we're at a time like 1975 in terms of dealing with marine pollution. We're at a time where, yep, we've tried to do something, it's inadequate, we know it's inadequate, it's not really being implemented, uh, and it's highly likely and very sad because there will be a lot of people that will suffer, but it will be disaster driven. So things that seem impossible now, like the thought of, say, the Australian or Queensland governments leaving a lot of oil and gas in the, in the ground and not developing it seems politically impossible right now. It's not going to stay that way because we will be affected by uh, disasters driven by climate change, public opinion changes driven by those disasters, just as it did for the um, oil pollution um, laws. So. When we, look, when we come to the climate treaties, um, we'll look at them, obviously, at what they're doing now, but, that, but they're not the N-word. They're clearly inadequate. And, and it's really difficult to predict what will happen to them in the future because you know, people or communities responding to disasters, suddenly what seemed politically impossible becomes the only option that the community will accept. So... Um, yeah, disaster-driven treaties. It's a big thing I want you to take away about marine pollution. Yeah, you can go and have a look at the IMO website if you want to get into the technical details. But for our purposes, you don't. Just have a little summary, you know, for the purposes of the essay on the exam about MARPOL 73, 78. Mention it, you know, you might mention Abaco Cadez or something like that. You don't need to worry about the technical stuff. The, the wider points are the more important thing from this lecture. Okay, it's just past 12 o'clock.
and uh, I'd like to take a, um, lunch early and come back so that we can focus on UNCLOS. So it's five past. Is it okay if we come back at one o'clock? So slightly less, or shall we start back? Should we just have an hour? So five past one for. Happy with 55 minutes or an hour? Sorry? Okay, well, how about we come back at one o'clock then? Um, so 55 minutes for lunch. We'll come back and we will look at this incredibly important treaty, UNCLOS.